welcome. It's lovely to see everybody here this evening for, I'm not, how was it titled? Sherazade's Children, the launch of Sherazade's Children, as we like to, to call it. I'm not sure how it was titled exactly in the, in the circular, but we do see this as the launch, and it is the launch indeed, and celebration of uh, this book, which you can see behind me. Uh, you might not be able to read that it says Global Encounters with the Arabian Nights, Sherazade's Children, edited by Philip Kennedy, which is myself and Marina Warner, who's sitting to my right. And uh, I'm joined, uh, also we are joined by Paolo Horta, who's the author of two of the essays in the book on various aspects of the influence of the Knights uh, on world literature, on uh, Burton and uh, uh, George Eliot, uh, uh, in, in the case of Paolo's um, essays. Um, so we're really just wanting to celebrate, and um, we have a, have a big sort of smile on our faces, even if it doesn't show. Because we've, it, was a lot of, it, lo it was a lot of work getting to this point, and um, you must say that the NYU Press, which published this book for us, has done a fabulous job um, in every respect uh, in copy editing. The whole production um, the value of the book, it really is, um, is um, really quite optimal. And, and we were very pleased when they allowed us to, uh, to include uh, a number of images, both some color images, there's some color plates and, and black and white plates, and you'll see that they're going to be looping. We can start the loop, actually. <laughs> uh, and we'll try and say something about the, the uh, images, because in, in, in a way, they tell the story of the book. So, um, but, uh, so the, the press has done a wonderful job in collaboration with us. And this is uh, a publication, both uh, uh, a collaboration uh, between the press and the NYU Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Institute. So I'd like to make that point, which it, this begins, or it, it continues a series of publications sponsored by the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, which is the research uh, branch of the university, as I'm sure you all know, because you, you hear my introductions ad nauseam. But in any case, it's, it's always, it's, this is a great occasion, and I'm particularly pleased that um, Marina could be here for us to launch it. Um, so without further ado, we're going to try and give a flavor of the book through the course of this conversation between us uh, for, for about 40, 45, 50 minutes and then open, it, open up the discussion to Q&A, because I'm sure you're all here for a reason, because you, you know the, the Arabian Nights, you like the Arabian Nights, you're curious about the title, you're here because you want to hear Marina speak, I'm sure. <laughs> also, so I should really stop speaking and let her speak. Um, so, you will. We thought we would start with um, each of us describing our first encounters with the Arabian Nights. This book, as, as the title which I read out indicates very um, generally, it's, the book is about, it's a series of essays and, and studies, and, and very deep and quite detailed studies, beautifully written in, in many cases, about encounters with the Arabian Nights from basically from the 1704 onwards, 1704 being an important date. But throughout the globe, so from Japan to America, South America, uh, uh, across those three centuries. Um, it's a subject that's not particularly rare in the study of the Arabian Nights, but it, those three centuries is, is such a broad period of time that even while one is aware that the, in, the Arabian Nights have had an, had an extraordinary and unique influence on world arts and letters, there's still a lot of work to be done as long as that work is done properly and in, in detail in each particular case. And I think this book is a case in point. And it's not a, a unique book of its kind, but we see it as a series of, of essays that will no doubt continue in, in this kind of mold, and we hope it sets a, a precedent for the, the kinds of ways that, the, that work should be done. In any case, all that said, we thought we'd start by describing our first encounters with the Arabian Nights, and so I will ask Marina to say something first. Um, well, thank you, Philip. That's, uh, and also, I, we really should thank Philip for the book coming into being because it came out of a series of, 
um, conferences and meetings in which he was tremendously involved. Um, I think one of the things that we wanted very much to bring out was the living quality of this body of stories, rather than their entombment in a particular edition or a particular translation. Um, the main sort of thrust of the inquiries um, is towards the capturing the kind of living voices. And actually, Alia Yunis is here, and, and she's a local writer who has done the epilogue um, in which she talks about Shahrazad as her heroine. And though it's the only piece of sort of actual direct creative writing in the, in the book, we wanted it to bookend it because we wanted to emphasize that this is a legacy that is a constant transformation from voice to voice, from stage, from screen, from, and so forth. That it, so starting with how we first encountered the Knights is in this one sense rather misleading because most of us in the, in the past of my youth did not encounter it so much in movies, which is what happens today, but in the rather august form of a beautiful edition. And I actually, it's the oldest book that I have from my father's library. And it was actually given to his grandmother. It's the first edition of The Lane, a three volume translation of the Knights, with 600 woodcuts, some of which I think come up in this loop, um, and is a sort of monument of Victorian, both you know, Victorian, famously Orientalism, Victorian scholarship, and this kind of turn to um, family entertainment. It was seen as both adult and suitable somehow for children. So I was given it much to the disastrous effect on the book, which of course, even though it would have been valuable, is now just a rag and a completely tattered and torn. Um, and, but my first, when I first saw it, it was the, these extraordinary pictures. And I think that actually, in some ways, that's one of the points of access that many people have to the Knights. Very often, the reading of the book is not really how we first understand it. We see it in different kinds of images. And we wanted to capture that. So that, you know, by doing theater, by doing cinema, by doing, um, actually, we don't have dance, but we have some opera in the book. We actually, we have dance? Yes, we have a bit dance. of dance. Oh, yes, there is dance, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So we try to capture these kind of visual, this visualization of the nights that happened in a much more immediate and vital way than actually the reading of these quite complex stories. Many people, I thought I knew the knights before I started working on them, and it turned out I didn't know them at all, the stories. I mean, Aladdin, Alibaba, but not the complex romances, the, the riddling comedies and so forth. I didn't, I, I, they, they were beyond me, really, at, at, the, at my early stage. So we know from uh, from 1704 onwards that all all the great authors were influenced by the Knights, whether it be Fielding or Dickens, uh, De Quincey, um, Coleridge, authors that we don't necessarily think of as being associated with the Knights, and yet and yet if if we study their biographies or their literary biographies, we know that they were um, in each in in. One thing I wanted to say was that the, 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 the title of our book, Ch Sherazard's Children, is supposed to, obviously it's a pun in many respects, it's supposed to uh, connote the, um, the offspring, the um, inspirational offspring of the Knights, and that um, Rook's Egg, which someone thought was a huge pita bread, who was looking bread. for... <laughs> the, the idea is that... It, it, it's, who thought it was a pita bread? Oh, a colleague of mine. <laughs> Two-dimensional, that's sort of yeah. flat, yes. But uh, no, the, the title, Ch Sherazar's Children, of course, is inspired by one chapter of Robert Irwin's, uh, um, in his famous book, The Arabian Nights, A Companion, which is really a turning point, it seems to me, in recent studies of the Nights. He has a chapter on the children of the Nights in, uh, by which he's talking about authors that have been inspired uh, by yes. the Arabian Nights. And, um, uh, what I wanted to say is that a lot of the, the authors that he talks about, he talks about their childhood experiences, and uh, so including Coleridge and De Quincey, and particular tales that they were marked by, uh, as we know from their biographies, Coleridge by the, the story of Zain al-Asnam, and De Quincey by a story 
which everyone knows called Aladdin. I was wondering if there's a particular tale that marked you from your earliest readings. Well, I think that it's the idea of the woman saving her life, but also saving others um, while she speaks. And um, the, this has had, it's, I mean, uh, writers, the ones you mentioned, take motifs from the knights and often take plots from the knights and so forth, but they also take structure from the knights. And uh, this, this was a part of the revelation to Europe and when they first encountered, was that you could tell stories in this particular way. You could nest them one inside the other. That was extremely, extremely influential. Of course, it had been done before by Boccaccio, and it had been done by Basile, too, two great compendium of fairy tales. But somehow, they had not had the impact. Italian Neapolitan writing of the 17th century did not have an impact on the Enlightenment in the way that the Arabian Nights had. In the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment, people found this a kind of extraordinarily convenient structure in which they could embed all the things they wanted to say. But you talk about Eliot, George Eliot and her use of, of um, one particular story, Kara Malzaman and Badura, um, as a kind of watermark inside, don't you? You, want, you should pick it up, inside Daniel Deronda. Would you want first to yes. talk about your first experience? Oh, yes. Um, sure, my first experience with the Arabian Nights, the, these were the first stories that I knew as a, as a kid actually in, in Brazil. Uh, they're very popular in Brazil as some of the Brazilian students who are here know. Uh, Alibaba and Aladdin. Um, my mother was an orphan from the, from the uh, north of Brazil, from the Amazon, where there are a lot of fantastical stories. And uh, the first book her adoptive father gave her was an adult uh, edition of small print and very few illustrations of the Arabian Nights. She was about eight years old, and I, I just saw that copy recently for the first time. Um, so for me, it, uh, it was quite surprising to learn that Alibaba and Aladdin, and I think many of the stories that most of us are most familiar with, are actually not in the Arabic manuscript of the Arabian Nights and were added. Uh, this is something that was quite uh, bewildering and confusing to me, having grown up with these stories, uh, in particular because I found out that uh, a lot of the Brazilian traditional sayings, my parents, uh, and expressions that they used. When I went back to Brazil, I found out that these were not traditional sayings. These were things my parents used and <laughs> told me were typical Brazilian sayings. So in the case of Alibaba and Aladdin, I feel this need to prove that they do come from the, uh, from the Arabian Nights. And, and that's influenced uh, the work that I do. I, right now, I'm, I'm interested in the, this figure of Hana Diab, this uh, Syrian traveler from Aleppo, who gave the stories of Aladdin and uh, Alibaba to Antoine Galland, the first uh, translator into French of the Arabian Nights. Mm -hmm. And I guess, like many of you, I first encountered these stories orally, and I'm very interested in how can we reconstruct that oral storytelling between Hana and Antoine Galland, which happened in Paris in 1709. And the, this, is, this is how these famous stories of Aladdin and Alibaba yes. uh, came to us. Until very recently, some scholars had speculated that, that uh, Hana Diab, the Syrian traveler, had never existed. He was a fiction, a figment of uh, the French translator's imagination. But now we know that, that he did exist, and he, he uh, kept a memoir, which we now have. So now we can start telling the, the yes. story of the stories of the Arabian Nights. I became very aware that they had become, ex they were extremely entangled, these stories, with our, you know, traditional nursery standards. I mean, we think of the fairy tale tradition um, of France with Cinderella, saint Rion and uh, La Belle au Bois Dormant, The Sleeping Beauty, and so forth, as, as being, but one of the writers, uh, Madame Donois, actually says in her, one of her forewords that I had these stories, the ones she's writing, from an old Arab slave woman, in, in Vieille Esclave Arabe. And, um, and I thought, when I first read this, that this was just a façon de parler. And that, now I wonder, you know, if she didn't have her own Hannah mm -hmm. Diab, somehow that she had, you know, that it wasn't, and that we had, we've overlooked the voracious curiosity that people had about each other's collections of stories and the intermingling that went on early on mm -hmm. and is a kind of process, an intrinsic process of literature, of the making of literature, these, these cross currents. You know, the pilgrimage site, the pilgrimage routes, the traffic, the centers of tr trade, the I mean, ports, Venice, Naples, these are the places where you get tremendous efflorescence of stories. And I, 
I think for me that's part of the fun of the Arabian Nights. Uh, in particular, uh, when you do the research and you read the diaries of, of some of these translators and you realize that, um, as you say, the, the, the French conte de fer, the fairy tales that we think of, like Cinderella, had just been published in France. Yes. So there's this craze um, for the fairy tale as a, as a form, as a genre. Yes. And into that, in the early 18th century, in the early 1700s, <coughs> the Arabian Nights stories get published. Mm -hmm. But there's a bit of a gap between what the um, a European fairy tale was supposed to be with, with morals. Mm -hmm. And uh, these often morally ambiguous tales. Uh, I was looking at some of these summaries that um, Antoine Galland records of, from Hanna Diab telling him the stories. And the stories often end with the good protagonist having an evil jinn slay half the people in front of him and put him in power. And Galland's scratching that out and coming up with a more appropriate ending that could fit the sort of moral certainties <laughs> of the French fairy tale as it yeah. should be. So mm -hmm. I, I, for me, that's a very uh, a, a fertile uh, tension. Yes. Yes. I would like to hear from Philip what, what his, uh, yes. I don't know if it was a, if a childhood encounter, but a first encounter first with the, encounter with the, with the Arabian yeah. Nights. Uh, well, it was late. I wasn't a child of the Nights. You know. I was <laughs> an orphan of the Nights. I mean, I'm sort of playing with words because the word orphan is so full of comment. It's so loaded in, in, the, in the study of the Nights. But I wasn't a child of the Nights in the sense that I didn't read them when I was a child. Uh, my mother's library was very... Um, Occidental. She was a bookworm, but she never introduced me to the night. Now, when I lived as an expat in Pakistan, and I was about six or seven, I did have a, a, an Indian ayah from Goa who used to tell me stories. She would sit at the end of my bed like Dunyazad, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Not under the bed, but <laughs> on the end of the bed. Because everyone thinks at the end of the bed means under the bed. <laughs> you read the stories. It's a, a funny thing. She used to tell me stories which when I came to read the nights much later in life, were, I realized were very much like Arabian night stories. Mm. You know, just chambers of, of, uh, of activity and, and, and atmosphere leading into another chamber, into another chamber, and the sense of getting lost, and that the protagonist was me and somehow being oppressed. And whenever you thought you were in a safe haven and the walls would start moving inwards. Um, I have very, very vivid memories of those of the way she told those stories, um, and I think it's relevant, you know, the, we know that the origins of the nights, as stories are, from India. I'm not saying that she told me Arabian night stories, yes. but it's a nice Persia coincidence. Persia too, for me. Iran and India. Um, the first mention of Shahrazad is in an Indian, isn't it? Is a, I mean, to the, well, the frame story. The, the, the frame story is, oh, is an Indian story. Yes. It, was, it was Persianized mm -hmm. with the name Persia, yes. Shahrazad, yes. which is a Persian name before it came into the Arabic sphere yes, in, around yes. the, in, in the Abbasid yes. period. Um, but, you know, when I went to England to boarding school, then on a Wednesday evening we were read stories, and then I didn't like the fact that I was a read story, that I was read a story rather than told a story, so I, wasn't, I didn't really yeah. listen to the Enid yes. Python and all the, <laughs> the whatnot. So they, the next introduction to the Knights was, well, I could go on, a, I could tell you about the boy who was reading the frame story whilst we were on a rugby coach on the way to a rugby match, and he seemed not to be part of the spirit of the occasion, reading a book on the way to a rugby game, uh, which is sort of anathema to the experience of, of hearty boys on a bus. But I remember reading the frame story on that bus and thinking, this is a really strange story, um, a dark story. But what I, the, re the real point I want to make is that I'm, I'm an Arabist, and I, I consider myself a student of literature now, of world literature. And when I, but when I did Oriental studies at Oxford and, and read Arabic and Spanish, the Arabian Nights were not on our syllabus. No. And uh, my teachers were really quite dismissive of the Arabian Nights as sort of sub-literature, because we were there to, to study the great literature written in Fusha, you know, so from the Quran to... Um, to, to Ibn Khaldun and, 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 and the oodles of literature of that kind, which the Arabian Nights we were never taught. In fact, the first, in the first summer of, of my first year at Oxford, we were, I attended a class called Classical Arabic Literature, which, was in, which I never got very far with because the professor never showed up, mm. <laughs> for one. <laughs> and then he'd given us the version of Ali Baba, which is actually a translation into Arabic of an English version. Yes. So it was just, the whole thing was just 
Who not is respected. this culprit, this dreadful person? I can't say. No, no, you can't. No. <laughs> I can't say. But we then, have but, to get some gin to look after. But a turning point in my experience, because I, I, you know, I did a PhD as an, as an Orientalist. Uh, I could explain that. It sounds nasty and... Uh, and there seemed to me all sorts of negative things to shed from that. But um, a turning point in my experience was reading a review. I took six months off as a PhD student. I spent, I spent them in Aix-en-Provence, where there were some great Arabists, and read a review in the TLS. It was Marina Warner's review of, of Robert Irwin's book. And it, it really was a transformative experience because she made the book come to life. I mean, she wrote as she always does in such a wonderfully rich way, and I was really transformed. I can, you know, you, there are moments which are very marked in your memory, moments where you read things, where you listen to something. And one was that moment of, of reading about the Arabian Nights in, in Marina's words, in the TLS. This, all the work that we do at university seemed to be much more accessible in the way that she wrote her review in the way that Robert always wrote obviously wrote his book, trying to revive the Arabian Nights for, for, for a wider audience, having been set aside because of the Orientalists. So, but that's really changing, isn't it? In the, I mean, in the Arab world now, there's, there's a different... It's changing in the mm -hmm. European world, but it's also changing the Arab world. I mean, the, Absolutely, the, the, yeah. there's now... A, in one of the articles, by, in one of the chapters, is by Feri Al Ghazul, who's a, a comparatist at the, in Cairo, and she talks about several different writers across the in, in conclude, across a, a big sweep. And then, um, sorry, uh, that, that's another article. So I'm getting mixed up. But Feri Al-Ghazul ends with um, Radwa Ashur, the um, writer, critic, novelist in Cairo, and her treatment of the Sinbad story in one of her novels. So she gives an example there, mm -hmm. a very strong example, of a poetic tale created in a distant way, it's not instantly recognizable. It's not a big epic of like Sinbad. It's a it's a it's a parable on a slave trading uh, sort of Gulf past, um, and but it's a kind of allegory of what happens politically today in in a distant way, mm -hmm. and it's small, it's tight, it's not got the baggy shape of the of the knights, but it has enough of the nights in it, in terms mm -hmm. of um, its source and its inspiration to, 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 be, to constitute a modern Arabic response. Yes. So, um, that was my experience. And did it... Um, but you mentioned Coleridge and De Quincey. Coleridge, yes, and yes. De Quincey, yeah. But Coleridge is a very interesting story. Well, Coleridge was... I mean, this, this gets back to the idea of children of the night. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a loaded title, and we're supposed to talk about what we mean by it. But um, the Knights is, a, this, is this corpus of literature which has evo elicits two extreme reactions. One is that it's, it's literature for adults, and it's full of pornography, and Burton was the great sort of um, promulgator of that, of that vision of the Knights because of his ridiculous <laughs> footnotes amongst... <laughs> Other things, and, and the other extreme was the way it, after the 18th century into the 19th century. In the 19th century, it started to get adapted for children, for the library, for the nursery, yes. really. Mm. Um, well, it was so much, it, much expurgated. I mean, totally in a way. I mean, yeah, it was. Yeah. It, it lost a, a huge amount of its power and energy through the expurgation, which now has fortunately been pretty much reversed. But not, of course, not for children. I mean, in the an 19th example, century. yes. I mean, an example. Well, Coleridge was reading it as a child, and he claims in his diaries that after his experience, his father was thought he was so frightened that he burnt it. Whether this is Coleridge's vivid imagination or not, but anyway, his story is that he loved the book. That he would um, wait, he would look at it on the shelf where it was, and he wouldn't approach it until the sun had risen enough to 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 light, to illuminate it. And then he would approach it. Um, and he, the whole description of him approaching this now sunlit, or at least daylight, daylit um, object is as if he's approaching a kind of wild animal that he needs to be very, very careful how he's going to handle it. And, the, and, the, <laughs> and then when he's opened it, he, the story that most frightens him, and it sort of relates a bit to your ayah, I think, and is that 
it's the story of the merchant and the genie. And, um, and it's when the merchant is walking along or riding along and he, he's eating dates and he spits the stones out. And one of the stones, I'm sure many of you know this story, hits and the genie comes rising in great fury, a column of black smoke and roars at, at the merchant that this date stone has killed the genie's son. And for Coleridge, this was a moment of total epiphany, and you can actually see it in his poetry, that what he did was then see the surrounding world, not in the Judeo-Christian way that there's a God safely up in heaven who is kind of, you know, there and, you know, he's not, but that everything in the air was actually possibly, you know, tra vibrating with forces that would, that could impinge on you, invisible forces that might suddenly come, come into a shape and then pr produce their you know, their passion, wreak their will on you or their, express their passions. And of course, the, un, from the point of view of narrative, the, what is the wonderful energy, the catalysts of these stories is precisely that unpredictability of the jinn. Because the jinn might go one way or another. They can bring you great blessings. They can shower gifts upon you or they can, you know, attempt to kill you. And that you can't tell. When one appears, you can't tell. That's not quite the same in, you know, if you have angels and demons, it's a bit different. You mentioned De Quincey also. Mm, if you yeah. want to. Mm. De Quincey was less of a fan of the knights. He claimed that he didn't like them because he found that the, the stories, the characters, and, uh, were sort of cut out of cardboard. But there was one exception, which is Aladdin, which might be an irony given that some people think Aladdin is not a, True. a, bo a bona fide Arabian night story, but that's another. Um, feel for discussion, but he did like, he was transfixed by the idea in Aladdin of this wicked sorcerer who could track down Aladdin halfway across the world by putting his ear to the ground and hear all the pitter patter of the, of the feet of people on the ground and hear, and from that distinguish the person mm. and that was his prey. And, mm. and he was haunted by that, fascinated by it, and what's even more fascinating by it is that that, that detail is not in the original mm. at all, so he made it up. Well, I think, it's in, I think he got it from Hassan of Basra. Ah. Because in Hassan of Basra, when the, when the sorcerer appears, the wicked uncle, who's actually portrayed as a child abductor, and his mother, Hassan's mother, actually, you know, Hassan is very beautiful, and this, uh, this uh, um, figure appears and, and wants to take him with him and teach him magic, teach him alchemy. And uh, the mother says, no, no, you mustn't go. You know, he's a pederast. He wants to, he wants to do terrible things to you. This is the kind of thing that was expurgated, this frank understanding of, you know, how the world can be in different ways. And, but uh, Hassan says, no, 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 I, I want to. And, um, and, um, and then the, but the sorcerer has found him because he's heard him from the other side mm -hmm. of the world. He knows he's the one who can help him. So, and he says, I have looked for, you must come with me. I have looked for you for across, across the world. I have come for you. And they're very much the words that De Quincey says, the sorcerer says to Aladdin, I have looked for you all over the world and I have come for you. You are my, you are my chosen one. Well, these so I think there's a sort of shift, which is easy to do when you read the nights. They're hard to keep apart. But I, th I think those shifts are, are exactly what are so fertile. I mean, the, the, creative, the creative misrememberings, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Borges writes famously about the the tale in which Shahrazad is telling these thousand and one nights of storyteller to Shariar so she can survive. Perhaps, I don't know how familiar people are with that original frame story, but Bohes has a strong memory of a night in which she starts telling a story of a vizier's daughter who to tell stories to, to save her life yes. must start story, and, and it creates a sort of infinite so loop. It's an infinite, And yes. scholars, you know, Italo Calvino and uh, writers have pulled out their hair trying to find the story in the Arabian Nights. And I, I often find that the, mis, uh, the misrecognition or mismemory or the misattribution of a story yes. to Aladdin when it's not there is, yes. is, is part of, the, of the, the rewriting, which is really what, what this book is, uh, mm -hmm. is focusing on. I was just interested, in, Marina, if we could get to the question of why. Why is it, so I can plug your previous book, <laughs> also available outside, the bookstore has been kind enough to bring out The um, Stranger Magic. Charm States and the Arabian Nights uh, by Marina Warner, which won the uh, Sheikh Zayed Prize as well as the National Book Critics Circle Award Prize. 
uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to be able to remember <laughs> them all. But there was this very interesting question of why these, we're talking about jinn and magic, and why is it that at the beginning of the Enlightenment, <laughs> these memories of these stories are so powerful for writers continuing through Coleridge? Um, why, so why, why this strange coincidence between the early 18th century, the beginning of the Enlightenment, and the Arabian Nights as a sort of smash hit of the day? Well, one of the ways that many people had um, explained it, or tried to explain it, that was saying that it was the return of the repressed, if you like, that, that we, needed, we needed to have an oriental place to imagine these um, erotic fantasies and so forth. And so it was like the, you know, the, the converse, obverse, um, of, the, of something that was no longer, as it were, permitted or admired within the Enlightenment. But actually, Ros Ballister, in her opening uh, chapter of this uh, book, where she writes about Julnar the Seaborn, which is the mermaid tale uh, of the same family as Hans, Hans Andersen's Little Mermaid, she actually makes similar points to the ones that I tried to make in, I mean, she's a friend of mine and we've talked about it, so it's not surprising that I'm not saying it's my ideas, but we have the same idea. And that is that actually there was a way in which the um, many of the comp elements, structural elements of the knights, actually spoke directly to modernity in a kind of, in a kind of metaphorical way. So for example, she uses slavery. The, the Julnar the Seaborn is um, taken, she, she becomes the bride of a mortal man, but she's a, in fact a mermaid. You, when she, she, you see her family walking on water in the, one of the images that comes up um, from the first edition um, in the Galant very nice early 18th century image. Um, so she doesn't have a mermaid's tail, but she lives under the sea, and when she meets the mortal man, and she takes him to meet her family. Uh, she's, he's very worried about breathing under the sea, but she explains how you can do it, and this kind of thing. So it's, but one of the things that she uh, is, to begin with, is mute. She trades her, for freedom in the world above, she trades her voice. And Ballister makes a good, good discussion of slavery, and and muteness, not being able to speak, and how this relates to the position of women in Europe at the time and to the whole discussion of slavery. I won't go into the details of it, but so it's both, it's double-pronged, it's both on the idea of liberty, um, of personal liberty, and also the idea of a feminist voice. And of course, Scheherazade herself is this frames, the frames the story of a, of a feminine voice having agency in the world, to use the sort of feminist jargon. And many, many 18th century women writers started using Oriental, the Oriental mode in order precisely to look at marriage, at, the, the, at speech, at public speech, at public opinion for women, handling a fortune, owning your own fortune, this kind of thing. And they used it, I mean, the harem story became simply a disguise for talking about Western institutions of, of female enslavement of different degrees. I mean, actual enslavement and then marriage. So that's one example, that's a social example. But I actually had uh, some other arguments about um, the uses of magic, and it seemed to me that we were denying uh, the operations of magical thinking in modernity, that in this case we were transposing them onto another, the other, the oriental other, because we had to deny them in our own, in our own um, societies. And one example I give is money, paper money. Um, paper money is a product of the 18th century. The Chinese started it a long way back, but it failed. There was instant inflation because everybody started printing it, <laughs> which is something we recognize today. So the Ming dynasty withdrew it. But, um, and, and didn't try it again, actually. They remained backing a currency that was backed by actually some, some, something of material value, gold, silver, whatever. Then, but then, in the 18th century, the first people who did it were the French revolutionaries. The coffers were empty. The revolutionaries had no money at all. And they hit upon this very clever idea of letters, of, 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 of printing banknotes. And um, interestingly, Goethe noticed this because he gives it to Mephistopheles to invent mm -hmm. in the last part of Faust. So Goethe, looking at the, disco the discovery or the invention of paper money, saw it as magically diabolical. It's entirely based on a, on a pact of trust and belief in the power of that um, piece of paper to produce this 
this wealth, or this, um, and and of course it breaks down as we know when revolutions happen in countries, their currency becomes the magic breaks, and you don't have a currency anymore. So, um, and also the other thing that seemed to me to be very uh, is that writing has particular power in the Arabian Nights, nice, as you know from talismans and and um, amu you know amulets. They need to be inscribed, and if you look, if you all get out your bank, bank note or you get out a credit card you will see that it is inscribed and encrypted with many, many magical ciphers in order to make it that valuable object, that effic efficacious magical object. I mean, this is you know, quite a stretch from, but it seemed to me that magic in modernity was related to these questions of circulating beliefs. And the knights are full of Ponzi schemes, full of, full of wonderful mad stories about people you know, about fortunes appearing and disappearing. and I mean, it's very recognizable as a kind of stock market crash or, you know, a, a, a kind of contemporary um, appalling crisis. Mm -hmm. And then remedied by some gin who comes in, some hedge fund dealer who suddenly does the right algorithm, you know, and we're all back in credit. <laughs> See, I just wondered, unless you got yes, something sorry. to mm -hmm. follow up on that, I'd put this up. Yes, that's the... the yeah. I don't know if you want to say something, Marina, yes, about yes. what this well, the, is. Well, this is a, a, one of the illustrations of Galland's first edition, um, and it's Journal de Seaborn. And you see the convention there, and you can see them walking on the water, going to visit her later, but uh, at the bottom. But in the top one, you see how the Ottoman Empire influenced the illustrator, but also they conceived of it, it is entirely contemporary. So if that's Journal herself, I don't know if it is, because she's not identified. Um, on, the, on, the, on the left, she's wearing 18th century French costume. So there was no, um, whereas the others are dressed as Ottomans. So we, uh, you're probably looking daggers at me because I haven't <laughs> jumped ahead, but we ought to um, take a little stock a bit and say, uh, describe the, the structure of the book where we've discussed it, even again, discuss the title of the book. Um, the figure of Sherazade and what do we mean by her children, uh, the scope of the book. Uh, do yes. you, would you like to well, take us through that a well, bit? Well, uh, um, Paolo has your... a piece in the first one. Well, the first section is called Translating. The second section is called Engaging. So there's a, a discussion of the different versions um, in the first section. In the second section, there are various different approaches. And you have pieces in both of those. And the third is all about performance. It's the different, mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, some of the images you've been seeing, the, it ranges from English pantomime to the extraordinary popular performance in Japan of mm -hmm. Takarazuka, uh, which is cross-dressed teenage romances, um, many of which are based on stories of the nights. Um, yeah. And so why don't you talk a little bit more about your piece on, um, on Burton. Oh, okay. Do you want uh, to say something about the intro before or mm. not? Up to you. Because well, you, you like the intro. Oh, yes. <laughs> Philip Sorry. wrote the but intro. I'm not going to, <laughs> to talk about it. The, uh, Philip's introduction uh, is a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, state of the art uh, sense of where Arabian Night, uh, where the scholarship on the Arabian Night, what the questions are about the Arabian Nights uh, today. Uh, it's very unlike a traditional introduction to a collection of essays and that it's not just saying, here's a summary or a little blurb of each essay that follows, but rather kind of like, you know, why the Arabian Nights and what has been said until now? Uh, what are the questions that people are arguing about? So yes, it's a very it's substantial. Um, a very lively, uh, yeah. lively work. I'd, just to bridge from what Marina was saying about modernity, which I found so fascinating about um, her book, uh, not, not only the, the sciences that you mentioned, but also anthropology and psychology. It's a sort of this wonderful attention to the Arabian Nights as part of the subterranean discourses of modernity that are in, in the actual DNA and fabric of actual modern science, not as a, necessarily as an escape from science, which I think is very interesting. And that, that's one of the things I think that some of the essays in this book do very well, which is point out that the Arabian Nights were of interest not only to uh, Ray Harryhausen or... Uh, Peter Jackson, or obviously sci science fiction and fantasy directors from you know Douglas Fairbanks, Chief of Baghdad, but uh, that realism is deeply indebted to the Arabian Nights. There's an essay by Robert Irwin, who wrote the Companion, 
which apparently is how Philip came to the Arabian Nights. Um, um, and, and it's about realist fiction. And, it's, and if you go to the Arabian Nights, some of you might be surprised after all this conversation about mermaids and gin. There are a lot of urban stories about merchants. There are, uh, in, in fact, privileging the everyday life of non-aristocrats and not, not of the elite in a work that was a work of popular fiction or middle literature, but it was not high literature, yes. represented a huge uh, opportunity for English writers uh, and European writers in the 18th and 19th century to borrow from the knights in that way, um, to, to write realist stories as, as Dickens, for example, was influenced by the Arabian Nights. And I would say Eliot was just one of many Victorian writers who were, who were borrowing um, from the Arabian Nights. So just to give one example from Eliot, her example of um, how she can do realist fiction, she actually borrows from the Egyptian magician and the mirror of ink. So at the beginning of Adam Bede, which is this provincial novel, she was simply writing about England 20 years before. She, at the very beginning of the book, she says, like the Egyptian magician and his mirror of ink, I give you now this scene from 20 years ago in a small town in, in England. So that the Arabian Nights were in the fabric of realist fiction as well, the sort of mainstream of, of English uh, fiction, not just in sort of the Gothic or the, the kind of supernatural genres that we might associate it with in terms of popular culture. There's the mirror of ink surrounded by two of, of Paolo's favorite characters, actually. So, um, yes, you should Lane, Lane on the top. Edward Lane, the translator of the edition that I had as a child. Oh, still have. Um, in his, uh, because as a translator, he lived in oriental dress. He dressed as an Egyptian kind of official, didn't he, in Cairo? It, it, actually, he, because the, um, Egypt was under Ottoman rule, what he did was he dressed as an Ottoman so people would treat him with more respect. Mm -hmm. Also, so he would be perceived as an outsider and not as an insider. But the actual mirror of ink, um, this is not a story, this was an, a factual empirical account that Lane gives of having invited the magician into his own apartment, uh, Lane's apartment in Cairo. And they performed this experiment by uh, pouring some ink onto the palm of a, of a, of a pre-adolescent boy who was still innocent and hence could see with the help of uh, the incantation of uh, surahs from the Quran, but also of jinn, the intervention of jinn. This, in this pool of ink, you could ask the boy to see scenes from the past or for the present. And that is the image which George Eliot yeah. used to describe her own craft of realist fiction. But, and then Borges, you have an essay exactly. on Borges' use of this image. Yes. And it, what, it's, what's interesting about Borges' mirror of ink. So Borges' relationship with the, with the knights was sui generis. It's like all his fiction. Um, he was fascinated by certain ideas. It's, it's, everything he wrote was uncanny, but highly structured, uh, full of symmetries and recursiveness. Um, the mirror of ink is one of those stories he wrote in his first volume of essays called A, A Brief History of Infamy. And what's curious about the mirror of ink is that he frames it pseudo-historically attributing it to Ibn Abi Tahir Taifur, who was a very great bookman of the 19th century, of 9th century Baghdad. Uh, there, is no, <laughs> there is no mirror of ink in Ibn Abi, Ibn Abi Tahir Taifur. Uh, so what he was doing, I don't know. Um, he also claims um, that he got the book, because that he uh, found the story translated in, in Burton's. Uh, but it's not in Burton. Lakes of the <laughs> looks lakes these of these, equatorial these, Africa. Yeah, these yes. are these sort of labyrinthine, you know, covering your traces. But it's yes. what he does, what he see, what does he see the well, guess, character in the mirror of ink? That's what the. But but then the so story the story sort of takes off because it's yeah. it's the best version of the story that Much the best, told, yes. and it's very it's really akin to the story of Duban and Yunnan. It's a story of. Uh, of, a, of, a, of a, a magician, a stranger magician who comes into town and cures, uh, cu and cures the chief of his ailments, but um, is then uh, suffers calumny, the calumny of, of jealous suitors, of jealous uh, courtiers, and then, and then is condemned to death. In, in the Mirror of Ink, of course, he's condemned to death. He's, he's condemned to death, but he says, he asks the, the ruler to look into the Mirror of Ink, which is an, a, a pool of ink that, he's, that is poured into the ruler's hands in which he can conjure any image that he wants. That is to say, the ruler can conjure any image that comes into his head. And the magician pursues this. Eventually, over, over days, 
the, um, the ruler wants to see an execution. He's and Jacob de Cruel is his name. Yes, mm -hmm. he is cruel. He wants to see an execution, so rather, um, for no reason other than that he's Jacob de Cruel. But, um, the magician bolts at this, tries to resist it, but says, well, uh, as, you, as you like, sir. And then so they pursue the image, and then comes the day of the execution. They see the, uh, the man to be executed. His face is covered, and, 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 and it is robed, and they cannot see the face. Uh, and the magician forces the king to, to keep seeing the image, and it develops. Eventually, his face is uncovered, and it's the image of the king himself, which he realizes as the sword falls on his on his neck and kills him. So it's, it's one of the yeah, wonderful, it's a wonderful <laughs> yes. recognition story, mm. which is really a version of the story of Dubain and Yunnan. And, um, and a, a lot of the stories of Borges have that kind of epistemology of recognition um, built into them. Um, we might talk a bit more about Borges later. Maybe we should identify some of the pictures yeah, some of the people pictures. have been seeing them. Good, OK, let's stop there. <laughs> so it's, that's it's, the it's, cover it's, of the book. Yes, we know that. Yes. And that, well, we should say something about that, actually. Okay, well, well, actually, one of the things that, um, it, it's an American painter, but one of the things that's, that struck, struck us as kind of appropriate is that they want to crack open the egg to understand it. They want to seize the contents. They want to, and, and that's a you know, famous Orientalist enterprise of wanting to kind of know and couldn't, and, and, and here it has a slightly comic um, edge because it's a sort of people attempting in this sort of quasi-scientific way with a ladder and... Um, to see what the rock, the magic bird, the high, the gigantic colossal bird, what it might be like, sort of Darwin, you know, Darwinists in the desert looking at this rock egg. And, um, but the other thing is that I, there's a very famous engraving of the Sphinx being measured by Napoleon's expedition hmm. and this idea that you can measure the Sphinx. And I felt that there was an echo here, the idea that you could seize the, you could seize the knowledge of this, mon this huge, huge mythical bird's offspring. So we're drawing attention to our own inadequacy a little bit, I hope, our comic inadequacy. <laughs> this is a wonderful um, Im a Persian image. Of, it comes to, actually, it's, and um, I found it in a, is it in, the, is it in Paris? Because we found it in a book, a, it was a Parisian catalogue, didn't we? But anyway, you'll see there that the, this young reader is, is created from stories. Uh, he's he's, a, he's a, a entirely made of characters and stories. These are four people. Do you want to say who they are, Philip? I feel I'm talking too much. No, no. no it's the Duchess Dumaine. The Duchess Dumaine, who is Voltaire on the right, patron. And Roger Pearson, who is professor of French at um, Oxford, has written an absolutely lucid, beautiful essay about Voltaire's early years when he was first on the run for being a dissident and a rebel. And he um, was sheltered by the, this great lady, the Duchesse du Maine, who herself was, not, was in trouble with the central authority because she was rather independent. She was an aristocrat who wanted her own autonomy. And uh, she sheltered this young man, but he really was on the run, so he was in hiding. And, she, and then he would come out at night and he would read her what he was writing when she was lying in bed. And so there was an element in which the Scheherazade um, relationship was, was reversed. He was, in, in, uh, he was um, I mean, he was telling the stories, sorry, he, but not reversed. But he was in the Scheherazade position, the sexes were reversed. He was in, running in danger of his life from the king. This, she was sheltering him. And he told her stories. And some of his early oriental tales, his earliest stories, hit upon this, this, this form of writing. And later, the, the much more famous stories than his early ones um, are become very clearly oriental, like Zadig. Um, but these early ones, Roger had found and related to this marvelous scene, the storytelling scene. And then there's Beckford on the left, um, William Beckford, very strange character, uh, very under-read, under uh, needs much more attention. Wrote in French, although he was an English um, semi-nobleman. And then on the right um, is um, Joshua Reynolds' portrait of his collaborator when he was learning Arabic. Um, so she's, she was a famous, um, rather adventurous woman who married, I think, several times. And, um, but when they were 
young and in Oxford, they found a Maronite, another Maronite, actually, a Christian, Han Adieb, to teach them Arabic. So Beckford worked with the manuscripts um, that are now in the Bodleian in Oxford um, and produced his own versions, the famous novel Vathek and others. That's Lady Craven. Lady Craven, yes. yes. She became the, 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 the Margra Margravine of Ansbach, something. Yes. She, yes. Mar Mar yes. Margravine of... Ansbach. Ansbach, yes. yeah. But then, we wanted to emphasize that women had this relationship of, of pa patronage, inspiration, often, um, and often themselves were active. Um, and the point of, art, of the article is really that his, his, his Gothic stories were much more influenced, were inspired much more by his knowledge of Arabic and the translation that he was yes. doing with Lady Craven than, than his hitherto been... Um, acknowledged. Acknowledged. Yes. This is... Edmund Dulac's Princess Badura. You could talk about that because Badura is the model for, in, um, in your, isn't it, in Dur Duranda? Yes, uh, uh, students normally like the story. It's about the most beautiful man in the world and the most beautiful woman in the world being brought together uh, by jinn who have been, not, not for their own benefit, the jinn actually have fallen in love with them, a female jinn with the most beautiful man in the world and the, and, and the male jinn with the most beautiful woman. And the only reason they're brought together is to settle a bet because, of course, the jinn want to decide who is the most beautiful, beloved. And only for that reason they decide to, to having transported them away from their homes, wake them up in turn. Uh, the woman will sleep while the man's awake and vice versa. And the person who falls in love the most, the, 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 the person who falls in love the most will be the least beautiful. Because, of course, if you're more beautiful, you will be less in love. And that's the, the prompt for this uh, very famous story, uh, of Kamal Azaman and the Princess uh, Adur. Adur. But you, uh, you argue that um, Eliot was also using that, George Eliot. I argue that Eliot in, in was Daniel using Daniel Deronda. In Daniel Deronda, her novel of, uh, of Jewish identity. It's a very modern novel. Um, it was her last novel. And uh, yes, uh, I, because Eliot had Lane's copy of the Nights as she was writing her novel and cites it, that there's a whole intertext there. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is, and this is Edmond Dulac, who became, was French, but became English, as came to live in England, and was one of the most prolific and most jeweled and, and um, the, the kind of really exquisite uh, color, printed in color, that when first you were getting very full color um, illustrations in these deluxe editions of the Knights, and he produced many, many famous illustrations, including many others of the scene of the jinn and so forth in uh, Karamal Zaman. She's a princess of China, which is why she looks Chinese in that, in the, in the story. So there, then we have some Japanese ones yes. illustrating these. So this is a Japanese um, illustration. The, the idea is here, I mean, very simply put, is that in, in, at the end of the 19th century, the Japanese were getting all their ideas about uh, the Middle East and Arabia and the Arabian Nights from, the, from their study of Europe. Um, what this shows simply is this sort of image of a Victorian man coming down uh, on a balloon. I think there's something more to say about that, but I can't quite recall. Now, this, this is, these are, the important text here is the lower one because that, is, that comes from a Taraka, Takaraz, Takaraza, Takaramzuka which um, is a company, it's very, 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 um, it's all the rave in Japan, it has yes. been for the last century. Huge fan clubs. Yes. The, 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 the young stars can't go out anywhere without being mobbed. And they do version, and they have done right from the, the beginning when they were first founded just after the First World War by, by a, an industrialist called Kobayashi. They've always done versions of the Arabian Nights. The Arabian Nights a la British pantomime. Yes, and they're all performed, they're performed all by girls because it started in a girls' school, a girls' high school. And so the, um, the, there the tall ones play the boys and the smaller ones play the girls and they all have their own extraordinary fan clubs. I mean, it's just they, they, you can't get tickets. You, um, they're extraordinarily expensive to get when you... <laughs> and um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a corner, a subculture of Japanese um, life. You can see the great the prince in the middle that's played by a girl. Yes. Well, the ethnography at the top shows Europeans and Turks, but they were, the point of the article was that they look rather the same. So 
So we're now we're moving into the st staged versions in, in, in closer to, to Europe. Although on the, the one at the top is that is that the Bung Bakavali is a was a, a, a film, an Indian film, Arabian yes. Nights film yes. in that genre. There's a very um, remarkable uh, piece of research done by Rosie Thomas in the book about early Indian cinema and its uses of the nights. Mm -hmm. Then on the right is Aladdin, and on below also, which is you, you're much more familiar with that. I saw it recently. I went. To, I took. Um, I have new grandchildren. I took them. I've acquired them. They're step grandchildren, and um, I took them to a pantomime um, in Eastbourne on the coast, south coast of England. Um, partly out of research, partly I was initiating them since they're not English into <laughs> into English British traditions, and it was quite extraordinary. The uh, um, the lavishness of this provincial provincial production. Mm -hmm. And apparently these pantomimes, which are mostly Alibaba, um, Aladdin, and other oriental stories, uh, so actually support the, or the entire provincial theater industry, because it's at Christmas that the money is made. And it was packed. It was playing three times a day. It was actually two hours long, which I thought was much too long. And um, so we went at 11 o'clock. Um, we were right at the back, because I'd booked too late. You know, it's totally, totally popular. And it has all these sort of very strange, which are very well caught by Carl Saba in his article on the on British pantomime. And of course, gen gender reversal as well within yes, British pantomime. Yes, yes. And this little girl, who you know is my new granddaughter, she turned to me and she said, "But she's a girl, you know." With it, with, with, this is the, the you know the um, um, Aladdin when Aladdin starts making love to the princess. This little seven-year-old, she's a girl. And then, and then when the you know, widow Twanky comes on, and, and she said, but she's a man. <laughs> um, anyway, there's so that, see, the, the, the relationship with the nice, with Orientalism, with, Sorry, um, with, with Commedia yeah. dell'arte. So this is the great Ian McKellen playing um, widow Twanky. This is actually, the top one is uh, actually, there are two articles about, about about the use of the Arabian Nights in Japanese uh, uh, staging. Um, and of the various genres of, of uh, drama, there's, there's Kubaku. Kyogen is, is, the, is, the, is a kind of farce of which the top version is, uh, um, yes. of which the top photo is a version of the. So you see the pantomime horse in yes, Japanese style. Horse, yeah. um, in, within an Arabian Nights story. Yeah. So these, these kinds of eclectic. Um, Schmorger's got books of, um, of culture, yeah. cultural entertainment. Your, your comments about the illustration of Princess Badura being uh, from China in this story reminded me of versions of these tales I've seen in Italy where, like in the tale of Aladdin, mm -hmm. um, Aladdin is portrayed as Chinese, his, yes. the princess he's married is portrayed as Japanese, and I've always thought, well, it was just confusion on the part of the Italian illustrators. But now I'm wondering, to what extent have the stories made reference to characters as being from many different places? Mm -hmm. Or is that something that was acquired over time, that figures come to be associated with different parts of the world? There's a wonderful geography in the nights. I mean, it's quite a recognizable geography. And but Aladdin is set in China. Yes, it is. And there's even a, a Hallmark TV version of it where he's actually played by a Chinese-American actor. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's interesting is if you go back to the early 20th part, part of the 20th century, in Western film, often you see these different forms of Orientalism, often a very a positive representation, of, say, of Persians, and negative representations of the Japanese in the same film. So if you go back to Douglas Fairbanks, The Thief of Baghdad, yes. you will see the sort of the way in which the geography of the Knights, because the stories are often set elsewhere. Um, but in, within a recognizably Muslim universe with genies behaving in a, a recognizably uh, but on the trade Islamic routes, cosmography. It's a recognizable trade routes. I mean, you get, uh, you get trade with, Af with Africa, trade across the Mediterranean, um, trade right across the Silk Road, all the way across to the... You know, that, that's, I mean, there's a magnificent study of the geography of the Knights by André Miquel, who is one of the that's translators right. of the French edition of the Knights. So, and, and it shows this... You know, it's a palimpsest, of course, of different periods right. of Islamic culture, but it shows this spread. Um, and actually, it also shows where the, the traveling routes of the stories themselves. Exactly. 
Uh, you get quite a clear picture sometimes in some of the stories of um, of the, of the uh, fights in the in the Mediterranean um, between Christians and Christian countries and and the, uh, the Arab world um, with with a lot of pirates and piracy and on both sides ca taking captives and um, so it's it's quite it's quite I mean there is a kind of historical uh, sort of subscript you know un, uh, sort of under the artifice of mm -hmm. the plots and the fantasy of course but there's it, it is rooted in a in a in, in a daily a daily reality so the the image from the cover for example is actually from Sinbad and we know that this was written not as an Arabian night story but almost as a commercial uh, illustration because there is a there is a source book that has been discovered which is basically how to how to trade in the Far East and the writer of the seven voyages of Sinbad obviously had that uh, in front of presumably him as he wrote his so that would be a good example of how the geography was not an entirely imaginary. Does, does, I, do we want to make one thing clear? Bef and just tell me if no is the answer, and I'll just won't go further. But 1704 is an extremely important date, and it should be made clear to everyone, and I'm sure, I'm sure half of you or all of you even know it, that that is an important date because that is when Antoine Galland, the French Orientalist, translated into, into French in a series of volumes across, well, 15 years of his life, The Arabian Nights, from a singleton, no, from the oldest manuscript, as it happens, he didn't know it was the oldest, in three parts, the fourth part was missing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an instant success and immediately translated into English, anonymously, uh, as the Arabian Nights Entertainments. That's where we got the title of the Arabian Nights, because they were called Al Flayla Wa Layla, Le Mille Nui. So, but in English, in the anonymous Grub, Grub, Grub Street translation, they were known as the Arabian Nights Entertainment. And in England, they, they also were an immediate success. And immediately, both in France and in England, through the 18th century, had an, an enormous impact on writers. Not yet artists, I think, but writers certainly, uh, and Writers stage. of Kant, and, yes, in the stage, of course, and, philosoph yeah. and philosophy. So things like Bluebeard, which Perrault had written, was adapted into an Orientalized style as as one of the authors. Yes, there's a very good essay by Elizabeth Cucci about um, the relation, the intertwining of the fairy tale Bluebeard, which was often illustrated and dramatized as an Oriental story, with Bluebeard wearing a turban in the illustrations and a scimitar. Yes. And very quickly, the last wife, the surviving wife, acquired the name Fatima. Well, um, Kuchi points out that actually this story of a serial killer of husband, who's a potentate, has very close relationship to the Shahrazad uh, Sharia relationship. And she shows how on the stage that was played out in various 18th century um, sometimes comedy pieces, in fact, sort of comic, the comic ogre um, mm -hmm. husband, but nevertheless, with a kind of moral message um, underneath. So I think it's important in, in our knowledge of the history of the Knights uh, as a world phenomenon to, to, to acknowledge the importance of that date, 1704. The first because they've been absorbed, now, now that they've been absorbed back into the, into the Arab world, it, they have been influenced in that absorption back into the Arab world by the effects of 1704 and those and it's the, the rules. It's the first print publication, yes. just in case. Yes. I mean, the manuscript is much earlier, and the and the and now and there are other there are 22 manuscripts, partial manuscripts of the knights. 